Are you ready to explore exciting careers in neuroscience and neurotechnologies? Then join me, your podcast host, Dr. Milena Krastenskaya, or simply Dr. K, and my amazing guests on the Neuro Careers Doing the Impossible podcast. Discover what it takes to turn the impossible into reality. Tune in now to a thrilling episode number 80. Dear listeners, welcome to another episode of Neuro Careers Doing the Impossible, where we dive deep into the world of neurotech careers that are shaping the future of medicine and technology. Today, we're happy to have Dr. Stephanie Cernera join us, a standout postdoctoral fellow making significant contributions to the field of deep brain stimulation, DBS, research and development, particularly for Parkinson's disease. With a robust foundation in biomedical engineering from Purdue University and PhD from the University of Florida, Stephanie has dedicated her career to advancing our understanding and application of DBS. Her dissertation broke new ground for focusing on closed-loop DBS strategies using wearable sensors for essential tremor patients. Now, in the prestigious startup at UCSF, she is at the forefront of developing adaptive DBS protocols. These innovative approaches utilize subcortical and cortical local field potentials to offer more responsive treatment options for patients with Parkinson's disease and dystonia. Stephanie's work doesn't stop there. She is also pioneering a decoding chronic naturalistic neural data through multimodal signal acquisition. This research has the potential to revolutionize how we understand and treat movement disorders, offering hope and improved quality of life to countless individuals. Today, Stephanie will share insights from her journey in this specialized field, the challenges and breakthroughs in developing adaptive DBS systems, and the exciting future of neural engineering. So, whether you are an aspiring engineer, a medical professional curious about neurotechnological advancements, or simply fascinated by the intersection of technology and healthcare, this episode promises to enlighten and inspire. Welcome, Stephanie. It's a great pleasure to have you today on our podcast. Can you tell our listeners, please, where you are joining us from, from what part of the world? Of course, and thank you so much for having me. It was an amazing <laughs> introduction. I'm joining you from San Francisco, California. And what are you doing in San Francisco, California? I am currently a postdoc in Dr. Philip Starr's lab at UCSF. And as explained in the introduction, I'm working on developing adaptive deep brain stimulation protocols using um, intracranial neural signals, either recorded from the subcortical areas, either subthalamic nucleus or globus pallidus internus and from sensory motor cortex. We currently have a paper that's under review and soon to be out on adaptive deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. So if the listeners are interested, it's currently a preprint and med archive, and then hopefully soon to be published. So stay tuned. Thank you so much. Definitely, we will be on a lookout. And can you tell us a little bit about UCSF and the program that they offer? Maybe something that it is known in your field for, because people are joining us from all over the world, and it's nice for them to learn about the institutions that are conducting such an amazing type of research. Of course. Um, UCSF. I guess applying to postdocs is a little bit different than applying to like graduate programs. Um, essentially, what I did is I cold emailed all of my potential postdoc advisors 
Um, and I was really interested in Dr. Starr's lab because during my PhD, I was also working on adaptive or closed loop systems, but using wearable sensors. And I really wanted to expand my knowledge into intracranial signal analysis. And Dr. Starr is really famous for this. He's an expert in this field. He was, I think, the first person in deep brain stimulation to essentially put electrocorticography strips on sensory motor cortex as an additional sensing area for these sensing deep brain stimulation devices. So I was really excited to work with him. So I just emailed him and it all worked out. Um, but UCSF's really known for their neurosurgical department. There's a lot of great labs, like Dr. Eddie Chang lab is there and he's doing a lot for speech um, decoding. So it's a really great environment. It's very collaborative in terms of like the Movement Disorder Center. So I'm very lucky to be here and lucky to have experienced my postdoc at UCSF. Yes, absolutely. Sounds very exciting. And you mentioned cold emails. Uh, actually, this is one of the questions that many of our listeners are asking. Does it work to simply send an email to a person you are interested working with? Uh, how does this work? So what was your experience? Sure. I think I emailed nine PIs and I received seven replies. But cold emailing, I had like a, a template of what I wanted to say. And then I left a section to kind of um, individualize it for every lab I was applying to. And I think that's really important when you cold email because professors receive so many emails a day and you want to stand out and you also want to sell yourself, which is really hard to do when you're a graduate student, but you definitely want to sell yourself and the skills that you can bring to their lab that would advance their lab. I think that's really important when you cold email and also tell them why you want to be in your lab. I think a lot of people miss that when they cold email. And I think that's super important too. So definitely the skills you would bring to their lab and why you want to personally work in their lab are super important. Seven out of nine, I think I had a good. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. You had a good conversion rate. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Very good. So what do you think helped you to stand out? Of course, you mentioned those individualized approaches, but probably you also saw some match between you and the laboratories you were applying for. What was that match between you and the places you were applying for? I knew I really wanted to work on intracranial signals. And I was kind of torn if I wanted to stay in deep brain stimulation work or go into more like pure brain computer interface work because I was a part of the Brain Computer Interface Society's postdoc and student committee. And I always wanted to do brain computer interface work. So I was trying to find a way to kind of transition into that. So I only applied to labs that were either deep brain stimulation or brain computer interface labs that focused on intracranial signals in humans mostly. And then I think it's really important when people are applying to postdocs to consider their advisor or their mentor and kind of understand what relationship you would have with them. So every time I interviewed, I had like a list of questions to ask them just to kind of figure out what kind of mentor they would be. Because I think mentorship is super important in a postdoc and it can honestly define your career path. So yeah, during my interviews, I essentially interviewed them too, just to find a good fit with an advisor. And that's kind of how I approached everything. And yeah, definitely have questions for them. Get to know the lab as much as you can and like past postdocs and current graduate students. They'll tell you the honest truth. Um, it's always good to 
find out that information. Yes, absolutely. And maybe you can share just some of the questions for our listeners to start thinking about what can they ask? What are the most helpful questions that you can ask? I really focused on three things. I wanted a mentor that would guide me, but also give me room to kind of pursue my own ideas. So I really wanted to obtain my own postdoctoral funding. I I didn't want to just be essentially like a cookie cutter of what my advisor was doing or what their grants were. So I was interested to see if people would let me apply to my own grants and pursue my own ideas. I always asked where they envisioned the lab would be in like five years, just to see if they have a set plan or where they think the field is going and whatever they were pursuing in their lab. I asked what kind of mentor they were, like were they hands-on, hands-off? When do they meet with their students? Do they even meet with their students? And kind of their vision of mentorship was a big one. I have the list somewhere. I'm also happy to share it. But yeah, it definitely threw some people through. They were like, why are you interviewing me? But I think it's important because a lot of postdocs move across the country or spend so much time in a lab. I think it's really important to also get to know who your future mentor would be. Yes, absolutely. So what finally was the main influence of your decision to join uh, Dr. Star's lab? I was stuck between two labs and Dr. Star, (laughs) I like randomly sent him grant ideas one night and Dr. Star is a neurosurgeon. Like he's always super busy. Like he has that like crazy neurosurgeon attitude and he honestly spends a lot of time with all of us. And I kind of got that vibe when I was talking to him like I can tell he really cared and I remember I sent him grant ideas like super late at night one night and I was like what do you think and he sent me the most like detailed comments back and it was just and I wasn't even in his lab you know like I didn't even sign with him formally or anything and I was just like okay he really cares like he's already giving me comments like he was already mentoring me before I was even his postdoc and that kind of set him he had the edge in that case and that's why I chose to be in his lab yes yes so what what you said that he cared he really cared mm-hmm. yeah so that that was the, the most important thing for you very very interesting thank you so much for this introduction I would like to go with you into your past for a moment, just to see how did you get to this point when you are working with intracranial recording, creating closed loop stimulation, helping people with Parkinson's disease. How did it all start? Do you remember yourself growing up? Did you envision something like that, that you will be doing something related to science, technology, engineering? Growing up, I wanted to be forensic pathologist so I took a really big into neurotechnology um I don't know what did it to be honest I think so my sister is six years older than me and I didn't even know what engineering was when I was in high school and she pursued chemical engineering and I also used to have a biology teacher in high school and she would also talk about like tissue engineering and in the future we can grow organs. And I was always really interested in that. And I was like, how is that even possible? And then she brought up biomedical sciences. And then with my sister pursuing chemical engineering, I was like, oh, this, I can do biomedical engineering. Like, but I didn't really know what it was. So I applied to Purdue because they have so many different types of engineering and as your first year engineering you don't declare your major yet um you just take general classes and I was confused if I wanted to do biomedical or aerospace so I took <laughs> that year to kind of explore the two engineerings um but eventually chose biomedical engineering 
because during my freshman year, I became really interested in like neuroprosthetics. So I declared biomedical engineering and then I declared a minor in mechanical to hopefully pursue neuroprosthetics in the future. And then what happened? I was taking a like a computational modeling class in biomedical engineering and I was still on my neuroprosthetic, like that's all I want to do. But in that class, we learned about deep brain stimulation and we were like modeling the electric field around the electrode. And I was like, oh, okay, I really like this technology. And back then it was really unknown how deep brain stimulation works. Like that was like 15 years ago or so. (laughs) So it was really kind of like sensing devices were in their infancy. And I became very interested in deep brain stimulation, which is kind of what brought me to the University of Florida and Dr. Aisha Gundes' lab. Mm -hmm. So you finished your bachelor's in biomedical engineering, yes, with a minor in mechanical engineering, yes, to work on neuroprosthetics. And then uh, you went to do your PhD? Yeah, I applied to a few PhD programs. I honestly only got into the University of Florida, but it was a good thing. (laughs) Uh, Yes, and then I did my PhD in biomedical engineering under um, Dr. Aisha Gogendez. Yes. So, and let's now learn about that because uh, we know Dr. Aisha Gundus, who also did her postdoc in Dr. Shock's lab, yes, at Wadworth Center. So she already worked with ECOC recordings and at the University of Florida, she started also uh, working with um, stimulation. So can you tell uh, to what type of research, what type of team did you join? What type of program? Uh, What um, was this program about when you joined so that we can see where, where you were heading? So applying to PhD programs is a little bit more formal than applying to postdocs. And I definitely did it incorrectly. So <laughs> I was not very good at applying to a graduate <laughs> program. <laughs> like I was the first person in my family to go to grad school. Like I didn't know what I was doing. And I was getting so many mixed comments from people. But I think it's definitely important to cold email professors too like even when you're applying to grad school or like there's a lot of like specialized conferences like the biomedical engineering society conference and it's super scary but it's always good to go up and introduce yourself to professors and yeah I didn't do any of those (laughs) super bad at networking they didn't cold email anyone or introduce myself to anyone and I think that's why I didn't get into any programs really at the University of Florida, I got into like the third round or something. So <laughs> not a good way to go about it, but it worked out in the end. But the University of Florida BME program, um, they have you essentially rotate through, I think, three labs. It might be a little bit different now before you decide on a lab. And I think the same thing with that or as a postdoc especially for your PhD, you really want a great mentor. Um, and Dr. Gundos is an awesome mentor. Um, she was always supporting me and still does. Like if I give talks or something, she's like in the comments and she's like, go step. <laughs> I've been out of her lab for so long. <laughs> she's amazing. Um, and I didn't technically rotate through any labs <laughs> to tell you me, but I kind of just chose Dr. Gundas' lab, um, and it worked out really well, and she's an expert in intracranial analyses, um, and then I was kind of the sector of the lab that was doing wearable analyses, so it was a new part of the lab, and I had, like, a really great team, like, every, so I didn't, I also didn't know how to code, or, like, I knew barely how to code before starting my PhD. I didn't know anything about signal analyses, maybe like the bare minimum. And I just joined a really great lab and everyone helped me and explained things so well. And I think that's also hard to find during your PhD. Um, But everyone in my lab like trained me. 
sat with me, like took me under their wing. So I definitely lucked out and I had a great environment at UF and a great mentor. And it all seemed to work out in the end. <laughs> but yeah, definitely if you're a graduate student, like look for skills you need because it can be a big learning curve. Yeah, and try to, I guess, boost your skills before starting graduate school. What would you say um, top three skills that you need to have, you must have when you go to work into the field of uh, neurotechnologies and uh, specifically uh, deep brain stimulation? Yeah, I think coding or at least signal processing is really important, especially if you're analyzing these intracranial signals or also any wearable signals. Since so many of these new projects, like you're using these multimodal like signal acquisitions because just having these neural signals isn't always super informative. Um, so we typically pair recordings with wearable. So I think that's really important. I don't know if this was a skill, but just understanding the field and where it could go, I think is super important in neurotechnology, especially now that it's expanding so much and there's so much going on in the space so I think it's always important like where your project can go and like how it can impact the field because like I was working on a central tremor and just because I was working on a central tremor doesn't mean what I was doing can only apply to that like there's so many other movement disorders or even like neuropsychiatric disorders that my project could have worked for so I think that's always important, knowing the impact of what you're doing. And then it's always good to know neuronet. Just knowing like what your signals truly mean and where they're being recorded from. It just could have like these oscillations could have different implications or mean something else. So I think it's always important to know neuroanatomy, which is also not my strong skill. <laughs> but just understand the papers because Neurotech papers can get really complex, especially when they start throwing like a lot of jargon in there. A lot of that can be from like neuroanatomy. So it's super important to know. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, you said that you needed to learn coding basically from, from the beginning. How much time did it take for you to start getting comfortable with coding? I would say it took me like a year or a year and a half. And I'm not a very strong coder still. Like, I'm amazed by people who have, like, super organized codes. And that is not me. It took me about a year and a half to get comfortable. It was a lot of time devoted to it. I also took a lot of classes that required me to learn coding, too. And then I watched a lot of, like, YouTube videos and all of the fun things just to kind of get comfortable with it. I also didn't have my own data yet in the lab. So my lab mates were kind enough to kind of share their data and then also talk with me about how to analyze it and really just walk me through the steps, which was super helpful and super important. Definitely like a year and a half, maybe longer until I was comfortable coding and like starting my own code. Mm -hmm. Was it MATLAB, Python? So I actually learned a few in grad school. MATLAB was the majority of it. and then. Python was kind of the focus of my PhD project because I was doing like real-time signal acquisition and processing of EMG signals. And I didn't totally know how to do that in MATLAB. So I did that in Python. So MATLAB, Python, I learned a little bit of C and then JavaScript because the device I was using only worked with JavaScript. So yeah, and then I also learned R. So I just... Tried them all. <laughs> See what worked, I guess. <laughs> what classes did you found um, the most helpful for uh, learning coding? I took a machine learning class, and I think that class helped me the most with Python. I had a really great teacher at UF in that class. Um, MATLAB, I kind of knew a little bit before during undergrad like our first freshman engineering class, you learn MATLAB. So MATLAB was a little bit easier for me, but Python definitely, I took like a machine learning and health class and that helped the most. 
with R um, in JavaScript and C, it was mostly people in the lab kind of explaining to me different like functions and how to like set up your code in these other languages. So that was definitely lab based, but Python, definitely machine learning classes. Take as many as you can. <laughs> <I> think that. <laughs> <laughs> you also mentioned some of the YouTube videos you were watching. Maybe you had some favorites to watch that you can also mention. Yeah, I don't quite remember the names of people. Yeah, it was also so long ago. There's probably like updated YouTube sites and because machine learning has also changed so much since like I've been in grad school and now with like this AI kick, I feel very bothered <laughs> and it's only been like five years. Thank you so much. Now let's dive in into the deep brain stimulation. Yes, the approaches that you were developing. So you were trying to deal essential tremor which can be applicable, like you said, to many other disorders. So what was the topic of your PhD? What did you really focus on? What questions did you try to answer or problems to solve? Yeah, um, so patients with a central tremor typically only tremor during movement. So a lot of them have intention tremor, meaning their tremor gets larger as they approach a target. So my question for my dissertation was, um, can we develop a closed loop deep brain stimulation system that essentially turns stimulation on when patients move? And then movement would be detected using electromyography sensors because patients with a central tremor have a lot of like stimulation induced adverse side effects. So a lot of them have dysarthria or a slurring of speech due to stimulation. So I was working on really only delivering stimulation when they would need it to hopefully reduce these stimulation-induced side effects. So the first focus of my dissertation was seeing if this is even feasible. So the first part was focusing on if we can develop a single sensor-based closed-loop system or a multi-sensor-based closed-loop system using a support vector machine. and. What I did with patients is I put like seven sensors on each of their limbs um, and I had them do all these different movements. And then I recorded throughout um, when DBS was on and off. And then I detected which sensor can best essentially decode whether or not they were moving. And when I detected a movement on the sensor, I would turn stimulation up. And then when they rest, stimulation would turn down. That was my first project. And then once we showed that we can feasibly develop a responsive or closed loop deep brain simulation device using these sensors, uh, the next step was to quantify adverse effects between normal stimulation. And I guess I should have mentioned before that deep brain stimulation is always on no matter what patients are doing. So it's on a consistent amplitude level. And this can cause issues like the slurring of speech because they don't always need stimulation to be at a certain amplitude level. So the goal of my project was to essentially modulate amplitude when they would need it. And for essential tremor patients, this is movement. So after we developed the system, we quantified if closed loop is actually better for adverse side effects like speech compared to standard continuous DBS. And these were patients that do not, or most of them do not have like clinical stimulation induced speech side effects, only two of them did. But we did demonstrate that closed loop was able to reduce tremor equivalently to um, standard continuous DBS, and that it also reduced or improved speech intelligibility um, compared to standard continuous DBS. So it is able to help some of these adverse effects, but this was only on a few patients. Um, so it definitely has to be quantified again in like naturalistic settings. So all of this was done in the clinic, but it definitely shows the first evidence that closed loop for ET can improve adverse side effects like speech. So that was kind of the premise 
of my dissertation work. Thank you so much. And uh, maybe for those who are not very familiar in general with this field, let's give some explanations. In which conditions do we usually see this tremor? So what patients were you trying to help? I was trying to help patients with essential tremor. Um, and this is a little bit different from like rush tremor and Parkinson's disease. Patients with essential tremor mostly only tremor when they're moving or performing action. Patients usually get DBS for tremor and then stimulation is always on um, at a constant level. And like I mentioned before, this can cause adverse side effects like um, stimulation-induced speech slurring. So we um, sought out to develop a system that would only deliver stimulation when needed or when the patient is moving. Thank you so much. And what is DBS? How is it implanted in patients? Who does this work? How were you connected to this process? Deep brain stimulation is a neurosurgical procedure where a depth lead, and typically the depth lead, meaning the lead that's implanted into subcortical areas, depending on the target nucleus, um, and that typically depends on what the patient has. So for essential tremor, the typical target in subcortical areas is the ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus. So a neurosurgeon does all the targeting. <laughs> Not super sure how they do that. Um, so there's different ways to target depending on who the neurosurgeon is. And then they create a burr hole in the skull and insert the depth lead into that burr hole, um, aiming for the target. And then the depth lead has four electrodes and there's several different types of like stimulation paradigms on these electrodes. Like you can have one active contact or two active contacts or like bipolar stimulation. So a lot can go on in terms of programming those four leads. And then newer electrode models have essentially tripartite leads for the two middle electrodes to get more focused stimulation. But yeah, so surgeons insert the electrode into the nucleus, and then they essentially cap the lead. And then from the lead is an extension wire. And that extension wire is essentially tunneled down the neck into an implantable pulse generator that's typically implanted in the clavicle, um, kind of like a pacemaker. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And how long has this um, stimulation been used already for how many years we use this uh, typical DBS until we started to try to develop other approaches like you were? So DBS has actually been around for a pretty long time. It first started, of course, before like FDA approval, but it first started in like pain. I can't quite remember the targets people were focusing on. And then in like the 90s or 80s or so, it really kicked off in movement disorders with um, Benavids. Or first papers coming out showing how effective DBS was for tremor and Parkinson's disease. So it's been around for quite a bit of time. Um, and then I think it received FDA approval in like the late 90s. And now there's a lot of push towards these like new stimulation paradigms like closed loop or adaptive, but continuous DBS works really well. Just for a select group of patients, it definitely could be approved. And that's where these new kind of stimulation paradigms are coming out. And then these other indications like depression or pain is under consideration too. Definitely looking at how we should stimulate for these because probably a continuous paradigm wouldn't work the best. Um, so a lot of work is going into like maybe they just need contingent stim, which is just stimming for a certain point of the day. Or maybe closed loop would work best for these disorders. So now there's kind of a push towards personalizing these stimulation algorithms. So what are those solutions that are currently being proposed and how your solution differs from them? What do you do that maybe nobody else does? 
So my postdoc work, a lot of closed loop or adaptive stimulation paradigms in Parkinson's disease have been using pathologically increased subthalamic nucleus beta. So beta is an oscillation in the brain and essentially increased beta has been shown to be correlated with the severity of rigidity and bradykinesia in Parkinson's disease patients. A lot of these algorithms were really quick. So they were sub-second algorithms and they were all performed on externalized leads um, in patients that were just implanted with DBS. So all like perioperative environments. And then typically these paradigms were not um, compared to like clinically optimized standard DBS or conventional deep brain stimulation because they were just implanted. And patients who have DBS have this thing called a micro lesion effect. So when they're first implanted, their symptoms actually get better for a few days, even without any stimulation. And then once that wears away, their um, symptoms come back. But yeah, these first studies showing adaptive DBS in Parkinson's disease were really on externalized leads in patients that were just implanted. In Dr. Starr's lab, we have this really cool device called the Medtronic RC Plus S. So this is a device, it's their implantable pulse generator that's implanted in the chest. And with this, Patients can stream neural data at home, and it's also able to perform embedded adaptive stimulation. So in our current study, or what we're looking at, is performing adaptive stimulation in the home environment. And these are patients who were already clinically optimized on continuous DBS, who still had like residual motor fluctuations due to their medication. Um, so patients with Parkinson's disease typically take levodopa medications. And as levodopa transitions throughout the day or as patients transition throughout their medication cycle, these present different situations and patients may need different stimulation amplitudes to suppress their symptoms or alleviate some stimulation-induced side effects. And one of those is dyskinesia or unwanted movements in Parkinson's disease patients. So what we're doing a little bit differently is we're performing adaptive stimulation at home. And a lot of our patients in the trial were still working. They were traveling for work. like They were just enjoying their lives. And we showed that adaptive DBS was outperformed, clinically optimized, continuous or conventional stimulation. And that's the study that's currently on Med Archive. But this has never been done before in this naturalistic setting. And we also tested adaptive versus standard DBS for a month. And patients were blinded. Um, they were actually able to switch themselves at home using like a, a patient computer. And that's how they're able to stream too. So a completely new study. The patients in the trial were just amazing too. Like they gave so much time to us. And it's amazing that we showed that adaptive stimulation is better. And we also, we had them fill out like daily questionnaires, so a little like iPhone app. And then we also corroborated this with wearable metrics too. So it's a really great study. Highly recommend. Not biased. Thank <laughs> <laughs> for it. But that's how ours is pretty different from where the field has been. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. And also you mentioned that in your doctoral work, doctoral thesis, you were using EMG electromyography to pick up the movement and then provide the stimulation during those times. So pick up the tremor that is happening. As I understand in your current work, because you mentioned implantation in the sensory motor cortex that probably you are picking up the signal already, not necessarily from EMG, but directly from the brain. Is that correct? So can you talk about that change and what is the difference between one or another and for patients and maybe even for the outcomes that you probably see? In my PhD, exactly. I was using wearable sensors and this was all in clinic. So with wearable sensors, we used a Medtronic device called Nexus D. So patients were still like tethered to a computer. So it, yeah, it had to connect to a computer and then patients 
weren't really mobile with that system. And then during my postdoc, the adaptive work in Parkinson's disease, the whole system is embedded. So we either use signals recorded from the sensory motor cortex or the subthalamic nucleus, which is a common DBS target in Parkinson's disease patients. So that's why patients could be at home since everything was embedded on the device. Whereas with the wearable sensors, they had an externalized sensor and then they also had an XSD kind of tethered to a computer. And how is it different in terms of personalizing that stimulation? Do you see a difference between using the EMG versus brain signals to trigger the stimulation? I was also lucky enough in my PhD where, so I had the wearable sensor portion of the project and then another PhD student in the lab, Dr. Enrico Opri. He wasn't using the Medtronic RC plus S. He was using like the version before that. So the Medtronic PC plus S. And he was kind of doing the same thing as me, but using sensory motor signals to detect movement and then close the loop. So for him, everything was embedded (laughs) because I had the externalized project. Both of them showed the same outcome. They were still clinically the same. I think going forward, Or like if we were to take Dr. Opry's project out of the lab, that would be more successful than the sensors since there's no way, at least currently, to have um, a sensor interact with the implantable neurostimulator. So I think for now with the embedded systems, brain signals or neural signals is probably the way to go so we can take it out of the clinic and test it at home. But I still think sensors are also just as great, just if we had that link, like maybe like Bluetooth or something to their implantable neurostimulator so they wouldn't have to be tethered to a computer. Yes, absolutely. And in terms of the signal analysis, how different is the signal that you are recording from sensory motor cortex or subthalamic nucleus? The subthalamic nucleus has smaller signals compared to sensory motor cortex. And then how we can sense within the subthalamic nucleus, we're kind of limited in terms of where we can sense from because we have to sense in like a sandwich configuration around the active lead. And that's to essentially eliminate noise from the stimulation artifact. So we're kind of limited in space within the STN of where we can record from or as cortex, we don't really have to worry about that since there's there's still stimulation artifact, but it's not as prevalent. And then signals are different, like frequency bands within the STN are a bit different from sensory motor cortex too. And what I mean by that is, so we record field potentials and you can essentially decompose these field potentials into different frequency bands using the FFT. And then these different frequency bands just have like generic names like beta and beta in the subthalamic nucleus means something a little bit different or maybe a little bit similar than beta in the cortex. So they're similar, but they're different. How you analyze them is similar, but how you interpret them is a bit different. Mm, Very interesting. Uh, So how, how can beta be different in sensory motor versus subthalamic nucleus? Just out of curiosity. (laughs) Yeah, but beta in the subthalamic nucleus is, in Parkinson's disease patients at least, it's increased, especially when patients are in the off medication state or DBS is off. In sensory motor cortex, And I guess we technically don't know in healthy patients what beta looks like in the subthalamic nucleus because they're not implanted there. But in sensory motor cortex, everyone has a beta. So it typically desynchronizes or decreases when patients move or when anyone moves. And then it increases again when you're at rest. So those are kind of the differences. I don't know what STN beta would look like in a healthy patient, but at least in Parkinson's disease patients, it is pathologically increased. And I think there's new studies now showing that sensory motor cortex beta is also increased in PD. 
um, similar to STN beta. And I think that's work coming out of Julian Newman's lab in Berlin. But yeah, there's a lot of new work coming in um, studying sensory motor signals in Parkinson's disease because this wasn't really done before and really looking at these like nuanced differences between these different frequency bands essentially across subcortical and cortical areas. Mm -hmm. So basically we were using that beta as a biomarker of the tremor in Parkinson's disease. In Parkinson's disease, beta is more associated with a medication state. So when we were stemming off beta in the essential tremor patients, we didn't use it as a biomarker for tremor. We used it as a biomarker for movement, since this is when patients would tremor. So that was our goal there. In Parkinson's disease, it's really a biomarker of like medication state. And that's our driving factor in changing the amplitudes versus in essential tremor, it was really movement versus no movement. And then <laughs> to make it more complicated, we actually didn't use beta in our med archive study. We found that a different oscillation really best distinguished between two medication states. And by medication states, I mean low dopamine states when patients would need more stimulation amplitude to get rid of symptoms like slowing of movement or tremor. And then high dopamine states are when patients need less stimulation because of like stimulation induced side effects or medication induced side effects like dyskinesia. And for that, we found a new biomarker, which we're trying to essentially show the adaptive community that it's a viable biomarker and it actually distinguished medication states best compared to STN beta. And this is stimulation and trained gamma. So lots of words, <laughs> but this uh, biomarker is a little bit higher in frequency and it's actually at half the stimulation rate. Um, but it's pretty amazing. Like when patients are off med, there's no stimulation and trained gamma. And once they essentially transition into the on medication state, stimulation trained gamma is present, and then we would decrease stimulation amplitude. Very interesting. Why are you calling it stimulation trained gamma, not just gamma? So what, what is the peculiarity of this particular gamma? So high frequency gamma is also in all of us too. So it increases when we move in the sensory motor cortex. But patients with Parkinson's disease who take levodopa, they have like a livid dopa induced gamma. And the difference between this and like high frequency gamma or broadband gamma. So levodopa induced gamma is a bit more narrow band. So it can be like five hertz in width compared to like broadband gamma, which is like 50 hertz or something else. So it's really a narrow band oscillation occurring. And what's really interesting is that so patients have this when they're totally off DBS stimulation. And then when we turn DBS stimulation on, this like narrow band levodopa induced gamma will entrain itself to half stimulation frequency. So it's really cool. Um, like if you plot it in time, you can see this narrow band oscillation kind of moving to half stimulation frequency. And that's why we call it stimulation entrained gamma. And now you are using the stimulation and train gamma to trigger the stimulation onset. Is that correct? So with the essential tremor patients, we're triggering essentially between zero milliamps and their clinical amplitude. In Parkinson's disease, it was a little bit different. They were always essentially changing between two stimulation amplitudes um, because they always need some sort of stimulation to help with some of their symptoms. And what we did is when we did not detect stimulation in trained gamma, patients were at their highest stimulation amplitude. And then when we detected stimulation in trained gamma, we lowered the stimulation amplitude because that signified that they were in 
be on medication state or in their high dopamine state. And we wanted to avoid stimulation or medication induced side effects like dyskinesias or unwanted movements. So yeah, no stimulation in train gamma. We had high stimulation and then presence of stimulation in train gamma, we had low stimulation in too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you are modulating the amplitude of the stimulation dependent on the state of the patient, yeah, which depends on the medication effect. Yeah. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. And it's also very interesting how you pinpointed the previous stimulation that was based on beta frequency. So it wasn't that the tremor was associated with beta, but the movement when you know that, of course, it will be associated with tremor. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for all those details. That's beautiful. And that stimulation induced gamma, you said that is fairly narrow band within five hertz, but in what frequency range do you usually detect it? So the narrow band or the levodopa induced gamma oscillations, those are the five hertz or so oscillations. Um, and they tend to be between like 65 and 80 hertz. And then the stimulation trained gamma, it depends on the stimulation frequency. So most of our patients were stimulated at 130 hertz. So DBS has a few programmable settings, the amplitude, frequency, and pulse width. So the frequency of stimulation tends to be above 100 hertz. And in our case, all of our patients were stimulated at 130 hertz. So our stimulation-induced gamma occurred at 65 hertz or half stimulation frequency. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It just came to me, the research that uh, is about schizophrenia patients, the question uh, and navigated TMS. The main idea is when to deliver the stimulation for it to be optimal. And in that particular research, it, it was some part of alpha so when they detect it, it's a good way for stimulation. The same is coming from the company I work at and it's stimulation for a functional mapping. So it's uh, uh, that peak of gamma frequency. So do you see anything like that being used for movement disorders, figuring out on the ongoing activity when actually it's the best time to stimulate? So there was a lot of amazing work that came out of the University of Oxford that showed in essential tremor patients, if they stimulated a certain point of the accelerometer um, trace, like a certain phase, they can essentially reduce the tremor amplitude. And they called this like phase specific situation or stimulation. And I think with movement disorders, that's definitely possible. And then there's also like in patients with Parkinson's disease, I think their motor symptoms are well characterized, and but they also have a lot of non-motor symptoms. Patients can have depression or impulsivity or apathy, and these sometimes are more clinically relevant to patients than their motor symptoms. So you can kind of imagine, and these non-motor symptoms are usually in like the alpha frequency. And I think we're this personalized medicine will eventually go is you can have like stimulation for these non-motor symptoms um, using like the alpha frequency and then like at the same time have an adaptive stimulation for their motor symptoms. So I definitely see something like this happening in the future, especially like on the electrode lead and within the STN, these like motor and non-motor domains are a little bit separated. So you can imagine you can also play with like the lead configuration where you're stimulating for these different symptoms too. So I'm super excited to see where DBS goes. I mean, I think it can get so advanced and like we can really personalize these stimulation algorithms. So I'm excited to see the next steps. I feel like it's going to blow up within the next few years. Yes, absolutely. And you just talked about lead configuration and many of uh, our listeners and I know students usually have questions. So for how long can those implanted leads stay 
in the brain of the patients. Yeah, DBS leads, they stay in there forever. So as long as the patient needs DBS, um, their lead can stay in the brain. Same with the electrocorticography strips or the ones on the cortex, they can also stay in the brain forever. Unless like patients unfortunately develop like an infection or something, um, then they'll be removed. But otherwise, they're in there. Mm -hmm. So basically, as long as the person leaves, yes, there is no restriction. There is no need to change them and and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned development of various lead configurations. So what is going on in the field? What are those new configurations that are being developed? Where the field is heading? So these leads are getting a lot more advanced or like the segmented leads I mentioned earlier. It's pretty difficult to program now. I mean, it really makes the space almost unbearable for clinicians, but it's difficult to kind of optimize continuous stimulation. And then once we get these more complicated, like systems like adaptive into clinic, it's going to be difficult to optimize and then as leads get more advanced so I, there's a push to use either recorded neural signals because now there are commercialized sensing devices which is really cool um medtronic percepts so anyone can have a sensing enabled dbs device it's not only research grade anymore um so a lot a uh, movement has been pushed towards using the neural signals to essentially optimize stimulation or using like a wearable sensor to optimize stimulation and a lot of machine learning. But that's kind of where the field is headed now since it is getting so complicated. And it's also really time consuming to program patients. It's very time consuming. Like sometimes or most of the time, the clinician will test every electrode lead and then increase stimulation on that electrode lead until they have a side effect. Um, and they call this monopolar review in movement disorders. And it's super time consuming. And yeah, so a lot of work has been going into making that automated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very interesting. And I still want to get back to your stimulation in trained gamma, yes? Where did this idea come from? Why did you start using it as a biomarker? I, I'm curious about the development. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> I, I'm a gamma girl. <laughs> I like talking about gamma. Um, uh, Dr. Starr's lab first reported on stimulation trained gamma in movement disorders using a research-grade device, the Medtronic PC Plus S. They first reported on this, I think, like five years ago. So it was a lot of work by Dr. Nicole Swan. And then the nice thing about the RC plus S device, it was a little bit better in terms of signal to noise ratio. So we were able to essentially record field potentials when patients were at home. And the nice thing about what we did is we didn't limit ourselves to certain frequency bands. We kind of searched the entire frequency space for the best biomarker to use in our adaptive algorithms. And that's where stimulation and trained gamma popped out. So with the patients, we did recordings both in the clinic and at home. And we searched the frequency space in both of those recordings. And we not only searched the frequency space, but also We didn't make assumptions if the biomarker would be best from the subthalamic nucleus or the sensory motor cortex. So no a priori assumptions. And we were surprised that stimulation trained gamma popped out as the best um, across patients in both in clinic and at home. Very, very interesting. Now, maybe you can summarize the main findings of this, your latest study of the DBS use at home of this adaptive system already. We were able to perform adaptive stimulation in at-home settings for patients. Um, Patients were blinded to whether they were on adaptive versus their clinically optimized conventional DBS. Um, 
we did a month of both stimulation algorithms and patients would switch themselves every few days into a stimulation algorithm. We also optimized the adaptive algorithm so they wouldn't know that they were in adaptive stimulation because sometimes patients can feel like stimulation increasing and decreasing. Um, so we optimized it so they wouldn't know or they wouldn't feel that. And using um, daily motor diaries and also wearable sensors, we demonstrate that adaptive stimulation outperforms conventional stimulation in the at-home setting. I'm very curious, how did you make sure that they don't see those changes in amplitude? Probably it wasn't an easy task. So what solution did you find? That is a great question. Um, yeah, so a lot of times patients will get paresthesias or tingling. The RC Plus S has a lot of parameters you can change. So we essentially slowed down the ramp rate if patients felt any paresthesias. And what that means is the uh, stimulation amplitude was decreasing slower, and that typically helped or alleviated those stimulation-induced paresthesias. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. What was the feedback from the patients that were receiving this care at home? Yeah, um, I also want to give a shout out to them. There were four patients and this was really intense trial. They gave us a lot of their time and they were all so amazing. And they were great to work with. Um, but they all chose to stay in adaptive stimulation. They recognized the benefits. And now we're currently, since it is a new type of stimulation, we're following patients. If they're on adaptive stimulation and we're doing like three months checkups with them to see if adaptive is still working um, because it's never been on for this long. Uh, so yeah, three month checkups, see if the algorithm is still working, check algorithm performance, um, check their clinical performance too. We also talk to the patients quite a lot. And you asked previously what a good skill is. If you are in the neurotech field, um, if you work with patients, definitely learning how to talk to patients and get feedback from them is a really important skill and just understanding them and putting them first is a great skill, especially because these devices will hopefully be in clinic one day. So just knowing what matters most to the population we're working with is super important. Uh, but yeah, definitely talking to them and was really important. Thank you. You have amazing results. Uh, the patients decided to stay on uh, this adaptive stimulation. It means that they, they see the benefit of it. And of course, like in any study, there are things that you want maybe to make better, to improve. You want to change something. So what are those things that you want to address in your future studies, your future work? So electrophoracography strips, they're not dangerous at all, but it definitely limits the people who can get like implanted with them. So now Dr. Starr's lab is moving more towards subgaleal leads versus subdural leads, which is electrophoracography strips. And this should help essentially the amount of people who can get sensing devices over sensory motor cortex. I think a lot of work with these leads will go towards like more or less invasive ways of recording from the sensory motor cortex. Because I think our study shows the importance of it, like the importance of recording from different areas of the brain for these adaptive paradigms. So I think it's a, a really important place to record from, especially in movement disorder patients. So I think in the future, more work will go towards making that portion less invasive so more patients can have these electrodes over that area of the cortex. Mm -hmm. And for those of our listeners who are not familiar with the difference between different leads, can you explain the difference between the ones uh, ECOG that you are using now and where you want to move in the future? 
So subdural leads actually go under the dura. So it's a little more invasive compared to subgaleal leads. So subgaleal leads sit above the skull. So it's still invasive, but a little bit less than kind of inserting leads under the dura and placing them like right on the cortex. And that's where typically our electrocorticography strips went. And now with subgaleal, they'll sit on the skull. A little bit less invasive. <laughs> We're testing now if we can still get the same type of signals because gamma signals tend to be uh, smaller in amplitude. And now that we're recording in subgaleal space, there's more essentially filtering now that the skull is there. So we're trying to see if we can still obtain those smaller signals. And then there's a lot of work happening too in this space using like endovascular leads. So essentially non-invasive and a lead can be placed over sensory motor cortex essentially be placed in a cath lab. So that's also being developed um, by a company called Synchron. So yeah, there's a lot of movement in this space occurring too. And I don't know which type of leads are going to be the best. Like, is it going to be endovascular leads or will it be these subgaleal or electrocorticography strips? I'm not sure. Yes, very interesting. And of course, endovascular it's and uh, we had uh, actually one of our podcast guests of course we had a uh, synchron we talked to nick opi in our podcast and we also talked to a person um, here international uh, neuroradiologist who is developing endovascular leads here in the states so very very interesting so where do you see the field in let's say 10 years um 50 years from now you you can choose the timeline yeah <laughs> <laughs> <It's> 10 years <laughs> 50 years is very very far um, in 10 years i really think adaptive stimulation will be standard of care like medtronic also just went through an adapt trial and their results are coming out soon um they used stn beta as their biomarker to close loop but yeah, I think it will be standard of care. I think neurostimulation and all this work in AI will help enable that as well. And I think stimulation algorithms will just become so personalized to the patient. And that's kind of what we're aiming for. So I think that's what I see in 10 years. <laughs> Maybe some people disagree, but I think personalized neurostimulation will be typical. So what is still missing? What gaps need to be filled to get uh, to that point where, you know, personalized uh, adaptive stimulation is used as just a standard of care? I think that depends on the disorder being targeted because with disorders like depression or pain, we don't really know what type of stimulation is best for them yet. Like I said before, like it could be contingent or it could be an adaptive approach. So I think more work has to be done just trying to figure out in that case why stimulation is best for those disorders. Um, for movement disorders, yeah, I think like in our case, our biomarker detection was data driven, but there were a lot of other parameters that weren't. And I think machine learning algorithms can definitely help make that process easier because it was very time consuming and a lot of work to essentially optimize those other parameters you don't really think about. And they had huge consequences on our algorithms. So I think developing machine learning algorithms that can optimize those parameters and really optimize the entire adaptive space will help bring it into clinic. And then Another huge point is making these algorithms like useful for clinicians that clinicians can understand and implement. I think that's really important. And I think that's where like engineers and clinicians like mistalk, <laughs> you can say. So I think getting clinicians feedback of what would be helpful and to see and help them implement adaptive stimulation will really help bring this into the clinic. And you mentioned AIs, and you already answered probably this question, but maybe you have a little bit to add. How can 
current AI development contribute to this field? What are the main contributions that we can expect from it? Yeah, definitely fine-tuning these other parameters or fine-tuning adaptive in general, I think AI and machine learning can be useful for, and their algorithms can also be developed to look at like different stimulation patterns and these other diseases too, to find out which parameters work best in that situation as well. But for movement disorders, I definitely think optimizing stimulation parameters, AI will help with a lot. What technological developments inspire you in your work? Because we have so many technological developments that are happening now. So what inspires you? Working on these adaptive and closed loop studies for so long, I've had an amazing opportunity to work with like the patients I've worked with, but they have been small studies and I've, I'm really inspired by advancements that are focused on expanding these technologies to a large amount of patients. And what comes with that is like reducing invasiveness. So that's what I'm most inspired by. And that's why I'm kind of leaning my career path somewhere different now. So yeah, definitely making it less invasive to help a larger number of patients is what I'm most inspired by. And how do you think the life of the patients can change if we have this adaptive individualized approaches as a standard of care? Yeah, I definitely think adaptive stimulation for now really helps in Parkinson's disease patients a select group of patients who still have residual motor symptoms on like standard of care deep brain stimulation. Um, and I think if adaptive stimulation was in the clinic, like those patients can definitely you know, benefit. And I think it's more patients who have those symptoms than not. And then not even thinking about the motor symptoms, but also the non-motor symptoms. And I think that will be developed within the next 10 years too. So also developing algorithms for those symptoms as well. And just understanding those symptoms, too, will be really important for the next 10 years to bring it into clinic. But then when you think about adaptive stimulation, for now, it's only like a few large DBS centers focusing on it. So that's why I think AI is also important because it can develop these standardized like algorithms and it can be deployed to a lot of other centers, too, not only the expert centers. Um, and I think that's really important to impact a large patient population versus only those that go to these um, huge DBS centers too. And you also mentioned that because you are thinking of less invasive approaches, you are changing your career trajectory. So what, what are you trying to change? Where are you heading with your career now? So I'm actually stepping away from academia for a bit, and I will be joining Synchron in like two weeks as a senior clinical scientist. <laughs> Congratulations! <Thank you. laughs> I'm really excited. Um, it's going to be a big change, a lot of a new world for me, really. Um, so I'm super excited to dive in soon. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's amazing. Um, what prompted you to make this decision? It's like a bold step, uh, stepping from academia, going into industry. So what prompted you to do that? It's been really wild because I've always wanted my own lab. Um, you know, I, I always wanted to be in academia, I, like loved academia. But I think during my postdoc, I just realized I needed something a little bit different. And that was really hard for me to accept, which is strange. So any other postdocs who feel that way, it's okay to leave academia. Because um, sometimes I think academia, if you leave, it makes you feel like you're a failure. And I don't know if it's like embedded in our heads or what. <laughs> it's a really strange feeling. So I'm trying to get over that, but I'm definitely not a failure. But yeah, I really wanted to get into 
the brain computer interface area. I've always been interested in it and I really wanted to make that step and kind of challenge myself again by going into a new area, which is kind of why I made the leap. Congratulations again. And actually quite a few people I uh, talked to, uh, they uh, told that they were trying to reach Synchron, to get a chance to apply for a job. And it's not easy. What do you think helped you to stand out and not only stand out, but to get a position at, um, at this amazing place? I spent a lot of time on my resume. Um, really tailoring it to Synchron and what the position was looking for. Also writing a cover letter, I feel like is super important. Um, I think so. I don't know if that's what helped pick me out, but definitely write a cover letter. Um, yeah, and again, selling yourself. It's so hard to do that when you come from academia. I don't know why. It could also just be me, but I feel like sometimes postdocs, they don't want to sell themselves and like, we're not taught that skill in our PhD programs or our postdocs. Um, and it's hard. It's hard to like hype yourself up. <laughs> I think I did that during my interviews, but I, I think it's super important to do. And just explaining like why you think you can make the jump from academia to industry is super important too. And then just... I think trusting yourself and like knowing you can do it helps during these interviews. Yeah, thank you. And what type of work will you be doing? How you will continue what you were doing already and what are new things that are in front of you? I don't entirely know um, quite yet what I'll be doing exactly. I guess I'll find that out in a few weeks. <laughs> I can give you an update. But yeah, it will be a lot of like regulatory work, bringing the Stentro to market is one of the big focuses of this position. Um, being at patient recordings too, and then also a little bit of strategy. So where can we take the Stentro next are the big focuses of this position. Yes, that's amazing. So I hope we will talk in a couple of years and we will see what you've done. What was the transition like and what accomplishments did you achieve during that time? And if you look right now at your whole entire career journey, what was the most challenging part for you and how did you overcome it? Honestly, I think these last few months in my postdoc were really challenging for me just because I don't know I think in your head you always think you're gonna want one thing and only do that and you like prepare yourself the whole time and like grad school like oh you're gonna be a professor and then you do a postdoc um so I felt super conflicted <laughs> when I wanted to leave so I think that was really challenging the last few months. Um, and I'm always happy to like talk to other postdocs or graduate students about this. I think it's really important to share. I feel like a lot of us get stuck and like, that's no fun either. Um, so yeah, the last few months have been very challenging. Yeah. So what do you think helped you to persevere still through all this emotional turmoil? Um, to still get on track towards your new goal and get into industry, get into synchron. I didn't want to do industry because I felt like I wouldn't be able to impact patients like I was. And for some reason that was pushing against me wanting to go into industry, but that's not really true. Like at synchron, like we're bringing this device to market that can impact so many patients and I think that's what has helped me and I think now with like the academia versus industry battle I think it's a little bit more lax like it's not the end of the world if you leave academia now for industry I think you can always go back because it's also really hard to like to be in academia as a postdoc like you're not well paid and 
it is super tiring and gets to you after a while. And um, I think just knowing like what I'll be working towards and like knowing the impact it'll make has helped the emotional <laughs> yeah, yeah. And thank you for your willingness to talk to people who might be going through the same so they might uh, approach you. Um, one more question is about doing the impossible. That's the name of our podcast, New Career is Doing the Impossible. Um, is there anything that maybe at some point of your career journey you thought as of impossible that actually became possible and how did you make that impossible possible I think when I first started in grad school I was so intimidated by everyone in my lab and they were all so amazing and they all knew how to code and process signals and they were just amazing all of them and it's really easy to compare yourself to people in academia um but I think I just had an amazing lab, an amazing lab leader that really pushed me over that feeling and helped me be successful. Um, so definitely surrounding yourself with a group of people who want to see you succeed and want to help you is super important. Yeah, absolutely. And there are so many people that are constantly comparing themselves to others. Um, what would be your recommendation for them? And they might not be supported by amazing people. Maybe they will be, but, you know, it might not happen right now. So uh, what would be your recommendation? Um, what's helped me is, um, and what I kind of tell other people is you don't know everyone's background. You know, you don't know how they came into their project, like let's say they're like eons ahead of you, but you're the same year in your PhD. Um, you don't know what they did. Maybe they worked on that project when they were an undergrad or something like that. So you just never know. And it's okay, like not to be the best. Um, I think that's instilled in us. Like when you're in grad school and you're like, oh, I have to do better than this person and everything becomes so competitive. Um, but that's not what matters you know like I think people fail to recognize how amazing they are and give themselves a break <laughs> you know you're doing an amazing thing and yeah definitely being easy on yourself is super important and everyone is doing awesome <laughs> thank you for those beautiful words um what is the best way to get in touch with you if people have questions and to want to you know communicate with you anyone can email me my gmail is steph cernera um, c-e-r-n-e-r-a at gmail.com yeah feel free to reach out if you have any questions um or find me on linkedin or on twitter or x yeah definitely feel free to reach out to me um i'd be happy to chat and talk to anyone if they're going through something or they have more research questions yeah definitely reach out yeah thank you and we will add this information also into our podcast notes for our listeners and as we are nearing the end of our podcast you you can share anything you want with our listeners so oh yeah like i said before um definitely be easy on yourself i think that's the number one thing especially if you're going through graduate school or a postdoc and you're kind of paving your own career path don't be afraid to make changes if you're not happy with where you are it's okay to change um you don't have to be stuck somewhere yeah and definitely always challenge yourself and but still be easy on yourself <laughs> be my, my main advice <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Th thank you very much, Stephanie. So many insights, so many supportive and inspiring words, and uh, lots of lots of knowledge about the neuro space, neurotech space, adaptive neurotechnologies, and how we can improve lives of many many people. So thank you very much, and of course, uh, I wish you all possible success on your career journey, on your new job at Synchron. And I'm looking forward to following your success story and seeing how you're doing. So thank you. 
this has been really, really fun. Thank you so much for being my first <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Thank you. Dear Neuro Careers podcast listeners, thank you for joining us on this incredible journey into the entrepreneurial world of neuroscience and neurotechnologies. I hope you've been inspired by the stories of those who are turning groundbreaking ideas into impactful realities. If you are looking for more guidance on succeeding in your careers, book a free consultation with me, your podcast host, Dr. K, at the Institute of Neuro Approaches. So, what are you waiting for? Let's navigate the path to success in the world of neuro careers and make the impossible possible together. <laughs>